Welcome to the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology's 2021 Symposium, Unfolding Intelligence, the Art and Science of Contemporary Computation. CAST was established in 2012 with the goal of building and building on connections between the worlds of art, science, and technology. This is the third in a series of symposia that CAST has convened since then, and as with its predecessors, we bring together artists, scientists, engineers, and humanists from within MIT and from the world at large to discuss areas of rapidly evolving research and urgent social relevance, and to find in that dialogue stimulation, confirmation, provocation, intersection, and, we hope, common purpose. At MIT, CAST partners with departments, labs, and centers to integrate the arts across the curriculum to enrich and encourage artistic collaboration and to provide support to faculty and members of the MIT community as they pursue their own artistic practice and or research. In addition to symposia like this, CAS facilitates the sharing of this creative work beyond the Institute by producing concerts, exhibitions, and publications and making them available to the public. So thank you for being with us today. We hope you will join us throughout the week at virtual events addressing the aesthetic, technical, and critical issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and computational media. We also look forward to seeing you on Friday, April 9th, as the symposium culminates with a live interactive event to which all attendees are invited and which you can join presenters and artists in breakout rooms to explore hidden threads between all that has been discussed this week. Hello. Um, welcome to the Q&A for the Unfolding Models panel of the Unfolding Intelligence Symposium. I'm Professor of Anthropology, Stefan Helmreich, and I'm thrilled to join you with the three exceptional speakers for our session, uh, who are Princeton University physicist and professor of astronomy, Priya Natarajan, Yale University Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Brandon Ogbonu, and Glitch Artist and Resolution Theorist, Rosa Menkman. And I hope you've been able to watch their really quite riveting presentations over this last weekend. Um, before we start up on this hour-long conversation, which I'm really looking forward to, I want to um, thank all of the people involved in this symposium. Uh, CAST Faculty Director, Professor Evan Zaporin, Executive Director of Arts Initiatives, Lila Kinney, my fellow conveners, Will Lockett, Fox Harrell, Caroline Jones. I also want to thank the cast producers, Dana, Heidi, Leah, Catherine, Susan, Lydia, and Harry, for all of the incredible work that they've done supporting us in this kind of insanely complex communications and logistics uh, involved in today's event. And uh, thanks also to, to Drew for providing ASL interpretation today. So much work. Um, I also want to acknowledge that MIT sits on the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation, traditional stewards of this land. And I want to note, too, that offering an acknowledgement like this through the data clouds and cables um, that we're talking through is also to recognize all of the computer models of communication that um, subtend the unfolding of our conversation itself. So unfolding. This is a panel about how tools and computation shape the models that scientists and artists make of the universe, the world, and of models themselves. And I wanna revisit and frame some of the arguments delivered by our panelists, whom um, if I can, I would like to have uh, join me on the screen. I think there's magic that can make that happen. Um, so just, just to kind of refresh folks' memories about our presentations and set us up for a discussion. Um, Priya Natarajan uh, told us how she uses computer simulations to explore the black hole growth problem in cosmology. With simulations understood as what she very usefully calls um, playing a mediatory role between theory and observation, a mediatory role, and more as potentially generative of new explanation. 
new evidence, new knowledge and prediction. So she argued that simulations may be approached as a kind of creolized language for communicating in domains that are simultaneously experimental, theoretical, and observational. So simulations become tools for signification that may be understood as what she as activating what she calls an interglot, a mix of languages. An interglot. <laughs> this is one of our key words, interglot. Uh, Dr. Buno took the analytic of unfolding in his paper and really ran with it, making first the connection to protein folding and protein unfolding, and then to a really, I think, inspired connection to unfolding as disentangling um, via Darwin's image, famous image of the tangled bank, which then also immediately got us to the questions of the entanglement of science and society, right? Um, genetically modified organisms, gene ed editing, and et cetera. And he argued that disentangling biological process requires models, models like the central dogma in molecular biology, DNA makes RNA makes protein, um, and models that also have to operate at the right level for the question that they're answering. So a model of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, will be operating at various levels for different purposes, maybe a level of protein uh, expression, maybe the level of population dynamics, maybe the level that embraces things to do with social inequality and structural racism. And he got us to think about how models as, he got us to think about models as instruments. Um, and also I think importantly as structures of analogy. So disentangling analogies. We wanna well, we think about how models help us express analogies, but also you know, demand that we disentangle the analogies that we use. Um, yeah, which analogies do we use? I mean, is evolution a game? Is evolution an algorithm? Those kinds of questions go into deciding how to model what it is. And Rosa Menkman tells us uh, that our media, you know, the media on which we do computer simulations come to us not only with promises to represent, replicate, record, and extend sense experience of the world, but also come to us in a range of formats, cassette tapes, A4 paper, <laughs> JPEGs, um, but also in material, they come to us in material manifestations which have their own limits, limits and their own affordances in the resolutions that they can offer us. Resolutions that are then animated through the kinds of compression protocols that are used for relaying something like an MP3 or a JPEG. Um, and that can glitch in really interesting ways that are sometimes disturbing, sometimes inspiring, sometimes productive. And so I think when I, I'm supposed to, I should have one of these for this too, right? Here we go. Compression glitch. Um, I also have this book, Glitch Feminism. There's all kinds of glitches around my desk. Um, so we learn through all of this that computer models are interglots, they are instruments, they are analogical machines, and they are also dependent upon standards, which are technical and political, uh, standards that demand particular kinds of compressions and that um, produce artifacts in kind of two senses, right? Artifacts as, as things, and then artifacts as things you don't want. <laughs> so, um, and I guess we wanna talk about all of that. The way that I wanna organize this conversation, just to start us off, and we'll also be taking questions from the audience um, later on, but just to start us off, I kind of wanna take each of our panelists in turn and kind of pose to them questions that are inspired by the other panelists. Um, so if I can, I'd, lo I'd love to turn to you, Priya, um, to, to talk about this really interesting work you're doing on the black hole growth problem in cosmology and thinking about that through simulations that mean to 
match in scale the observational data that you have from uh, various telescopes and to do and 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 how they do that using um, machine learning algorithms um, but I guess after watching Brandon's presentation um, which offers that models may be seen as instruments I wondered whether you thought of interglots about which you can say more uh, whether you thought of interglots as themselves kinds of instruments so maybe maybe yeah, do um, that pick that yeah. up uh, like. thanks Stefan that makes sense. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, I think, um, you know, I want to uh, first sort of clarify that, you know, when I am talking mm -hmm. about uh, simulations, I am setting these cosmological simulations apart in many ways compared to other okay. ways numerically visualizing data and processes and equations and so on. And the reason for that, um, you know, as I've argued um, in the presentation, was that um, you know cosmology is a very peculiar field. We cannot perform any kind of controlled experiments, laboratory experiments or whatever. You, what you have in the universe is what you get. So we visually record and make observations, and then we have to sort of interpret them in the context of some conceptual model. And these conceptual models used to be sort of paper and pencil equations. And we're also very lucky that we have the ordered physical laws that give us a uh, structure and a frame to do the interpretation. And increasingly, when you can't do anything on pa pencil and paper, you've needed uh, computer simulations. And so that's how simulations were originally seen as being merely enhancing and mm. uh, not really generative of new discoveries. You know, also, you know, there's the awkwardness, philosophical awkwardness, that you are sitting inside the universe that you are observing. So there isn't this traditional distance between the observer and the observed that, you know, other than the quantum funniness aside, in classical physics, that is a very important assumption because that, that's tied mm. in with other deeper concepts like objectivity and so on and so forth, right? So here we are, we are sitting in the middle of this universe, we're making observations and there is only one universe, so I can't actually replicate it either. So in many ways, you know, cosmology is not really a science as traditionally defined. Mm. Uh, and therefore simulations are play a very important role. And so and uh, um, I've argued that they play the sort of mediatory role of an, um, and and they are they are an interglot because they are actually universal in the sense that now simulations allow you to connect models and theories to observational direct uh, data directly except there are some limitations as you pointed out the fact mm -hmm. that we are not able to replicate in our simulations you know the exact survey volumes that are observationally accessible to us with our telescopes at the moment and this is where machine learning comes mm -hmm. in and so there have been two instances, only two instances, where simulations have actually been generative of new knowledge. One is a very interesting instance, which is, you know, the firm Double Negative that did the visualization for the movie Interstellar. So they actually solved mm -hmm. Einstein's equation. And what they found, they found, and, you know, Kip Thorne, who has been working in this field, a Nobel laureate, you know, one of the sort of, you know, big figures in uh, understanding uh, black hole physics, he noticed in the visualization that there was a nonlinearity that he had not picked up before. So there's actually a scientific paper on which people from double negative of authors. So that's the one case that I really know where, you know, a simulation has been generative, something that was completely unanticipated, unseen before. And the second example is the one that, you know, I gushed on about in my talk where, you know, we recently um, realized from just looking at simulations that there ought to be a very large population of wandering black holes in the universe. And mm -hmm. um, a, a handful, uh, you know, one or two have been found um, and because normally we expect all these black holes to be anchored to the centers of galaxies like, you know, our own galaxy harbors, a dormant black hole and so on. So I think the... Mm -hmm relationship between models, uh, speaking to uh, Brandon's work. So this relationship between models and observational data for cosmology is somewhat apart mm. and slightly different. And, you know, I would mm -hmm. also kind of um, clarify that it's not quite a Creole. It is like a universal glot. So it's an interglot in that sense. You know, Creole mm -hmm. is very specific 
for two target languages, right? If I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So this right. I'm claiming is much more universal. Um, mm. It so happens to, um, and as for the kind of untangling that both Rosa and Brandon talked about that you wanted me to connect to, I think what I found really interesting is um, the way in which we conceptualize models, whether the um, it's a primary visual uh, mm -hmm. representation for the model, or, I mean, and I think in physics, right, we have this added advantage that we have mathematical equations that offer and laws, these kind of tight correlations and cause and effect, which are very clearly defined. So I, what I found really intriguing is to hear from two people in mm -hmm. two fields where causality is not, for us, causality is a constraint. I mean, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know you, uh, the cause happens before the effect. And you can actually draw a line and connect the dots because you have these principles, these universal law of gravitation, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very interesting to see Rosa's work mm -hmm. and Brandon's work where mm -hmm. there aren't necessarily such clear cut joining the dots. Um, in Rosa's case, you probably impose that by hand by choosing to compress the data, decompress and compress the data, alter the resolution um, and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I mean, that, yeah, go, go ahead, Rosa. Yeah, yeah please. No, I'm, I, I enjoy this bridge to uh, what you're talking about. And my, in this case, I would say it connects mostly towards the, the blob that I ended the video with, which I use also as a tool, I would say. It's a tool to not only show how image making works and a part of that is compression. I wouldn't say that's the only thing like resolution setting has a lot of stuff involved, whether that's like the CCD chip or um, the aperture or the amount of energy invested in the machine that is making the image, right? So in that case, this blob is this like metaphoric latent space for any possible image and you cut it away and I think there's an analogy to your research also where you're uh, talking about affordances. I see these um, these affordances are axes that cut the blob and they cut away compromises. So the compromises are the images that are no longer being made because you know you've got you set a resolution. I think you used a word for that. I'm trying to find it real quick. Um, do you remember this word that you used? I think it. It was a very I, interesting. I did use resolution. I did um, use resolution in a slightly different um, uh, sense in terms of um, when I was talking more about the limits, Rosa, which I think you also yeah. come to when you're talking about the blob. You are talking about sort of the limits of understanding of you know what is possible, and yeah, uh, I think that is even that is input exactly input assumptions. That's like what I'm talking about, even. That's what you're uh, you're saying, and I think input assumptions are a very interesting way to frame. It's like the same idea, but it's um, for me. I use the word affordance, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, maybe I can I can bring Brandon in in here. Um, I'm really interested in this question that you you brought up, Brandon, about the level at which abstractions operate in models, right? Which you know, to use to use Rosa's term just now, involves a set of compromises, right? In order to decide that a phenomenon is made of particular levels, you have to compromise. Um, so I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about that question of how you think through the levels at which the models you write operate. Maybe I'll just start, start ask you to start there. I've got more, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, fabulous kind of interaction already. Very, very fun to explore the, the connections here. I, I think what's uh, interesting and fun about talking about the levels of a model question is that it really does invoke like domain expertise and the art part of modeling, right? That's actually where the imagination enters it. Uh, that's where understanding enters it. And this is why like the notion of simply having students, for example, learn to uh, just a suite of mathematical and, and, and computational techniques 
is the end all be all to being able to understand, for example, what underlies the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And this is where a lot of the problems of modeling a complex system comes from, is that we don't, we, we, we have an infinite number of, I mean, we're not, you know, we have a lot of different tools we can use to examine phenomena, but we aren't clear about what the question actually is. And we, you have to be clear about what the question actually is to build the proper model to address that question. Right. So, you know, I, like, like I talk about in the talk with regards to the electrons and the calculator, let's just take an epidemic, for example. I mean, I could understand everything about, um, you know, the way proteins fold. Let's just say we completely solve that problem. Right. One that's very, very kind of modern and cutting edge. I mean, that could tell you absolutely nothing about whether or not a vaccine is going to be effective. OK, like that's a completely different question. Right. At, at a societal level, it's a completely different question requires completely different level of understanding and requires a different model in order to address that question. And I think we can walk that over into every single one of these problems, certainly in physics. And it's, you know, it's very humbling to be on the stage with a physicist, because I think you know, a lot of the modelers in my field wish they were physics, right? The physics envy kind of concept. Right. I think we've we've borrowed from this tradition of being able to understand the world in terms of a set of analytical descriptions. And what we're finding is that, right, that those are powerful, but you do require this other dimension and understanding and art and insight in order to be able to capture biological phenomenon in a meaningful way. Um, so just to summarize, I mean, I think that level of question is one that is humbling, um, but I think that is where like the creativity, the domain expertise, uh, you know, and study and, and these types of things really, really do separate kind of the good models from the bad ones. And we're seeing this play out in phenomenon like the pandemic. Yeah. Can I ask you more about that? Um, you know, since since we do have you here as an evolutionary biologist <laughs> who thinks a lot about epidemiology and its various entailments, how would you classify and evaluate mm -hmm. the levels at which are the COVID-19 epidemic models are operating mm -hmm. what are the levels no, great which, question you know, all the stuff in, yeah mm -hmm. Go ahead. well great question and i think i think now as of you know april 2021 i mean i think all like all of the levels of models are operating to address different questions okay but let's go mm -hmm. a year ago i think it's fun to think about this as a chronological thing right because early mm -hmm. on we weren't quite interested in how mutation a and mutation b were playing together on the spike protein and how that whether or not that allows you it to whether that that means the vaccine will be effective or not. We wanted to know the basic shape of the epidemic. And of course, you know this better than anyone, Stephen, with regards mm -hmm. to kind of the shape and the wave analogies and these things that you've pioneered. Um, we want to know the basic shape. Like what is how bad is this thing going to be? Is it how fast before we get to A and B? How long do we need to be under lockdown? Those are macro scale questions. In order to understand that, you need to know some kind of gross properties and the debate about this are not thing, which is now common knowledge, this parameter that we use to understand how contagious a pathogen is, for example, it's now common knowledge. But the idea here is this allows us to give us ge general character and shape about the way an epidemic looks. And, and that allowed us to make big kind of national and you know social policies. You know, right. That's where the debate, I mean, really still is there in some ways, right, about what we should do and when we, when we should open and when we shouldn't. Right. But that kind of defined the early window. And that's one level at which models are mm -hmm. useful. Right. So the mm -hmm. early UK model, for example, that talked about, you know, a couple million dead and and these predictions that were very, very dire if we don't do anything in a hurry. I mean, that's been kind of debated. But that was at one level. I think now we're at a much different level, right? I think, or, or rather, our models include other le levels. And they are about things like whether or not we can expect the vaccine to be effective against the UK strain or the Brazil strain or the South, right? Like those are, that's a completely different question. What's interesting and fun to this point about intercalates, right? Um, mm -hmm. That Priya's presentation, that what, what, an, what, a, what an amazing term that I'm certainly going to take with you know, moving forward. What a, what, a, what a brilliant way of thinking about it is connecting these two things. It's connecting the levels. Mm -hmm. And I think, right, and so models can allow you to do that. You can build a model that, that about the molecular evolution of the virus at the protein level, and you can ask a question now about the way mm -hmm. that, how, how can we think about vaccinology across a population over the next several months? We can actually build bridges between these things. So I find that to mm -hmm. be kind of, we had to arrive there, though. It took us time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to make a very quick point. This is just absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I think what is remarkable about um, this panel and the themes um, are how well all of the different strands uh, and pipes that we all used to think kind of converge. And so the COVID mm -hmm. question, for example, for me, right, uh, from what Brandon has outlined in you know, Stefan's work and Rosa's work, mm -hmm. I mean, don't you guys think this was one of uh, the absolute uh, exemplars of the provisionality of science? Like we really mm -hmm. don't even know, as Brandon said, what is the right question to ask? What are all mm -hmm. the right questions? And you know, we've and we've seen all these various modelers coming in with their inherent biases, wanting to focus on one particular question without realizing that no one question can be isolated in something like the pandemic. Mm -hmm. This is a network. There are all these questions that all have to be tackled together. And, you know, it's not like you have, you know, oh, there's one equation for spread that that's all we needed to get and that would resolve everything. No, uh, this is a very complex problem. And this is, I thought this was one of those classic cases where you see the process of science and the provisionality. Mm -hmm. We know as much as we know at any given point. And then we have to, as Brandon said, and as Rosa points out, we have to, without limit, keep asking questions because we don't even know what the right questions are and which all questions mm -hmm. need to be answered to find, um, you know, the the solution. Solution being, how do we survive this as a globe? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think this is so mm -hmm. interesting. I haven't thought about the, the pandemic in such way, but I would say what you're proposing is almost that the pandemic is a scenario in which uh, scientists could almost have uh, a, a real life te test scenario in which they can communicate and, exp and, and open up their knowledge to the normal public, which is something people like me, artist, artistic researchers do. That's my job, basically. Like I do research, but I don't convey it to the scientific community per se. I convey it to a normal audience that watches art. So it needs to be like, there is um, a basic necessity to make it accessible and people wanting to access it. And what Brandon is also saying, like we're, we're missing kind of a translational aesthetics here. And as you're also pointing out with the Kip Thorne example, right? Where um, uh, the, the, the artistic director of a movie about a, the shadow of a black hole suddenly finds a piece of science by showing it through um, their mm -hmm. renders. What's really interesting and what's been really interesting is that what I've seen throughout my research is that there is a very um, deep relationality between Hollywood aesthetics and the aesthetics of science and programming, right? Because programming mm -hmm. being uh, Silicon Valley and Hollywood being in LA, those are places that are almost next door. And these people actually come and visit each other. They conversate. Is this a study? Is this way of showing this? Is this the proper way to do it? And then there is a scientific aesthetic exchange. This has been happening. But at this point now, we're seeing that, um, as, as you already pointed out, that there's people from all over the disciplines that all think that their one particular question is the question to answer the problem of the pandemic, that they need to voice this. and so. What we're seeing is that there is not enough bridges. There's not enough interglottery <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to make the problems, to voice the problems in between and uh, research fields, right? What I would propose, um, because I'm actually quite worried about just an interglot, because I, to me, it becomes very closely connected immediately to a new speak of sciences, right? Because new speak is this like, um, the uh, 1984 reference to George Orwell, where they are creating this one language that takes out all the metaphoric speak, because now we have like one word to capture a particular state. Um, this one-on-one -on -one idea of translationism. I do hope, and I think that's what you are also for, is that there is still this like uh, metaphoric, analogous, poetic space in the interglot, and maybe there is like some space for an extra glot in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, you know uh, mm -hmm. one other um, interesting uh, thread that I um, 
see um, in this mention, one of the reasons the pandemic has been so problematic, aside from the impact on our lives, is the reaction of the public. The fact that, you know, the science was evolving in real time. Our understanding, limited by the questions, as Brandon said, limited by the level at which we want to solve, right? And so people are seeing the uncertainty in science, provisionality and uncertainty, right? Because, you know, people were supposedly baffled, right? We are saying no mass today, and then tomorrow you're saying mass, like, you know, we don't know, all of this is changing. And I think this is the peril of you know, getting into unknown territory, moving into unknown territory. And um, what are the sort of, um, you know, metaphorical connections? And as Brandon said, the levels mm -hmm. and the kinds of connections that we have to simultaneously be aware of. And to me, it seems like, um, you know, for the pandemic, it might have been, you know, interesting to have started off thinking of this how to approach this pandemic and modeling it as a cross-disciplinary adventure right from the beginning, instead of mm -hmm. focusing on the people who are modeling contagions, providing different models, and then the public health people uh, chiming in as a result, reacting to the model. So I'd be curious to hear all of you talk about the sort of the reactions to models, right? I mean, why, uh, why isn't the modeling more integrative? Mm -hmm. Just for a brief, just to jump in, and I know there's a lot of COVID <laughs> fatigue, and we don't we don't, we don't want to spend the whole time, you know, talking about that example. But I, I must uh, say to to connect these points, I think for all the negatives and all the things that were botched, and I've written a lot about them, and I think Priya, you mentioned a lot about a lot of the problems we have. I think a positive example of particularly where the arts was very central. Um, for in a positive response was the flatten the curve movement, right? Which was a data visualization that was created by a data artist, right? And and that flatten the curve became a social justice rallying cry. It became an epidemiological rallying cry, and it really defined like the the positive part of the response. And that was not right uh, invoked or, or or created by scientists at all. Or, it was somebody who was a data visualization person that ended up driving this public health campaign. So I think to, to the point you just made, Priya, that's like a good example. And that is a model. Like there's no numbers in it, but it mm -hmm. is a model, right? In the ways that we talk about, and it is a model, certainly the way that Rosa has mentioned with regards to how the arts can drive and kind of reframe how we can think about uh, complex problems. Mm -hmm. I would expand. Yeah, I would expand that yeah. to include it as an interglot, that kind of synthesis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th thanks for bringing that up, Brandon, because I was going to think of precisely following Ro Rosa, think about, right, the politics and the possible pitfalls of aesthetic productions of scientific knowledge in visualization. The curve has done a lot of really good work, but it also obscures things. Right. I mean, it obscures the multiplicity of, of curves. It did for a while, I think for many, obscure the radically different experiences different communities had where one had to realize there are many, many curves happening. And, mm -hmm. and some of the curves are revelatory of things like structural racism, underserved mm -hmm. public health infrastructure, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so, but I think that's super interesting to think about the... Mm -hmm. To, to think about that piece of scientific visualization as a as as producing an aesthetics that does and does not surface particular mm -hmm. kinds of matters of concern. I want to get back to aesthetics and ask Rosa um, a question about um, about aesthetics, and I want to ask you what your experience was of of watching the talks by Priya and Brandon. In terms of that, what kinds of aesthetic um, trends did you see kind of coursing through the way they presented their talks? What kinds, maybe you have some kind of glitch radar. What kinds of glitches did you see that might possibly leap into their work um, unannounced or things like that? If that makes Honestly, sense. Honestly, I didn't see any glitches. Uh, also, I have to say, like, I. I appreciate glitches. Um, I think we are uh, diluting the word glitch a little bit here. A glitch would be like an mm. unexpected break from a 
uh, an expected mm -hmm. flow or a functional flow. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in like popular culture, this has become something more stylized and it's been taken out of yeah. that technological definition. And now it's become like mm -hmm. a, you know, a language, a visual language of its own. When I looked at Brandon Sempria's uh, presentation, I don't think there was a lot of glitch there whatsoever, not from the stylized form and definitely not what I can say for a scientific point of view. You guys are perfect. Well, I guess, <laughs> However, maybe another yeah, way, no, the aesthetic form, yeah. I mean, maybe another term to, to put in here is standards. I mean, what kinds of standards did you see, you know, animating the way the work had to be kind of held together? Well, what I like um, about uh, Priya's uh, presentation, but maybe that says more about me than about um, scientific, well, maybe not. Uh, when I was go going through her slides again, uh, I recognized a lot of the images that I use in my own presentations. There was one slide that mm -hmm. you had three different images. One was from um, the Big Bang and the time mapped after it. There was the shadow of um, uh, a black hole and um, another image. And in my last presentations, I've been using those particular images, point blank. Like, so... Um, what I'm starting to see is that there are like these tropes or like mm. images that are maybe overused. They become not just um, uh, an, an illustration, they become the illustration. And that's actually dangerous, right? Because then we consider a black hole or the shadow of a black hole in this case to always have these like particular floopsies of energy or whatever <laughs> it is. Um, and I think that is dangerous because maybe black holes are not at all this round or and also because these are simulated images in the sense that they have given been given color or whatever so for the non-educated uh, scientific uh, interested person they might actually um, open up um, just a standard a standardized aesthetic that makes them yeah. misunderstand that these things are much more wide in variety and that a lot of yeah. these things can be colored differently be understood mm -hmm. differently basically that what you're looking at are like uh, energy waves or sound waves rather than you know a color a shadow i don't know like whatever so yeah, that's no, a danger that's of very, standardization yeah mm -hmm. very important point you make rosa and uh, stefan for guiding her to that i think that these images are meant to structure our imagination but there mm -hmm. is a fear that they may limit our imagination mm -hmm. and we have to watch out for that yeah, yeah or, and i have know, something to, to, to add to that maybe uh when i was mm -hmm. at cern where i did my collide at cern residency i was really looking for imagery aesthetics of particle physics like uh, research into the smallest tiniest bits and what I found was that there was actually very little artistic interpretation of those places. All you see are just uh, the the events uh, in like a collision diagram or just numbers. And I was wondering a lot of the times why is there so little artistic interpretation in a place like CERN? And what I finally, um, my conclusion was finally that we don't actually have a lot of movies taking place at the particle physics level. So there is not that like, mm -hmm influx of money mm. of uh you know artistic directors of research into how to make open up this space to mm -hmm. an other audience which has again both positive and negative consequences right but so um when i was there actually i believe it was also kip thorne who came to visit because he was going to make a movie about tiny uh, superheroes mm -hmm. or something I don't know but that was really funny to me because I think it's like one of the first times they had a um, Hollywood director going to do research on the tiny stuff which is something that there's not a lot of imagination about that that we all have to imagine by ourselves somehow well I think mm -hmm. you know in astronomy we have the advantage thankfully that the sky belongs to everyone 
and we all have experience. Uh, we don't have to do much, just existing, looking up, you know, being upright as homo uh, sapiens. We've had access. So, I mean, there's a connection that anybody and everybody can make to our visual uh, images, right? And there mm -hmm. isn't the same kind of visceral connection and access. You know, a child growing up in Kenya, looking up at the night, will see a better sky, actually, than we do in New Haven, for instance. But um, you don't have the same with particle physics. There's a lot of layers of interpretation, computing models, many layers of many unfolded and uh, folded models that uh, lie between us and uh, that representation of data from particle accelerators. Mm -hmm. And also to use Rosa's terms, again, there, there are compromises built into the kinds of theoretical commitments that you want to make in the model, right? Um, I want to um, I want to make sure we get some time to get questions from our, our audience, and I have a couple here. Um, maybe I'll start with one to, to Brandon. We have a question. I'll read it. It says, you shared that abstractions and metaphors are how incomplete models could be generative. In your observations, would these poetics be challenging for scientists to grasp? What are your recommendations for young scientists to enhance competence in using abstractions and metaphors in modeling? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think I think the challenge here, I mean, is the way that we teach science and how that is incompatible with a lot of the ideas that I talked about with regards to how, you know, abstractions can be generative, right? We're taught, we teach people kind of the analytical tools to be able to understand the way of, in, in, in physics class, the way a, a pendulum you know, is swinging or something of that nature, which is a really important thing to understand because those are kind of fundamental forces of the universe. The problem is that everything that is interesting will not be neatly described by those types of uh, equations that way. And a great example, and one that I think of when I connect with Rose's work, um, is the whole problem of modern genetics is one where we have a complicated mess of genetic information interacting with environments in all these essentially infinitely complicated ways to create me standing here at, what am I, six foot, let's just round up to six foot one, right? Um, and the idea is that that is, that that is composed of all of this information interacting right in this way. And I think we're limited in that way by the manner in which we have built scientific knowledge, which is one plus one equals two, two right? And everything is kind of very linear and structured when in fact it's this blob, it's this tangled bank, it's all of these complicated things that are interacting in one way. So what I would say is, so how do you actually address that? It's that we really need, you know, I think the easy answer is like liberal arts education, right? Or something like that. But I think much more nuanced than that, the best models do not require numbers. And this is what I say. It starts conceptual and artful first. It doesn't matter how complicated the problem is, whether or not it is Schrodinger's cat. And I don't know how Priya feels about that. So, you know, maybe you don't like that analogy, but the point is it's been, it has been useful for people to think about a complicated problem whether it's the Punnett square, which is an analogy, whether it's the central dogma, which is an analogy, whether it's these, you know, whether it's uh, another one that Priya, I want to hear you talk about the, uh, what is it, uh, the Nicholson-Morley, whatever, it, these, I think we really need to teach how to abstract reasoning independent of numbers or even scientific principles at first, and then use that to kind of build scientific knowledge on top of. I practice this mm -hmm. in my research program, and I think it would, it, this is kind of useful uh, for young people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. That that really connects well to a question that's come in for Rosa, you know, precisely about non-numerical representation. The question is about narratives. So this is a question from one of our viewers um, to Rosa, and it reads, narratives seem to be prominent in your practice. Could you further elaborate how narratives have helped enrich your artistic research especially in exploring your subject matters that are often quite abstract, resolution and data, or even non-existent. This is your work about impossible images. 
Um, how would you describe the role of narratives for you in formulating, challenging, and expanding computationalist and representationalist models? Yeah, um, I have a twofold answer to that. And one part I've actually already covered, but um, when I was talking to scientists at CERN, uh, one of the scientists told me that to her, actually, science is the challenge of finding uh, things out and the pleasure of understanding. But then, of course, uh, as I'm an artist and I'm not writing a diary or you know just doing research in my head until I make a paper, I want to put it into legible or understandable information to my audience. Okay, cool. But then there was a second part is where when I was visiting, because that's the beauty of this CERN award that I received, is that I didn't just get to be at CERN and talk to all the scientists there, which was amazing. I talked to 40 scientists and I realized that there are many types of particle physicists. There is not just one. Uh, every, every particle physicist by themselves already use another language to talk about the same things. And that depends if they're mm. like philosophical or more mathematically uh, geared. But to me as a newbie, as somebody that is definitely not of that realm, it became really hard to follow their language and to learn to probe what to be able to expect from them, right? And then it turns out, okay, they have not one or four big experiments. No, actually they have hundreds of experiments and all these experiments, they perceive stuff through a technology. Cool. How do they perceive stuff? They watch something, whether that's a wave, whether it's light, whether that's or a light wave, or whether it's a sound, or whether it's an energy thing. I don't know. Like they watch all this stuff going through something, whether it's a magnet or a lens, an optical lens. They watch it through something, they probe it through something, and then something comes out. But some of these people, they try to dump it down for me and try to make it understandable, and they talk about it as photographic machines and then when i come to the next scientist they get very upset if i say oh so this part of the <laughs> camera <laughs> is the lens and they're like this is not a camera <laughs> so what i realized is that not just does every scientist have their own language these machines they all also um are generally um uh Called, I don't know how to say it, like referenced mm -hmm. to by different names. And what I really enjoyed by both Priya and Brandon is that Priya, you used um, messengers. And I would say those messengers, uh, they go through a window. That's like the, the probing mechanism, right? Uh, whereas um, in uh, Brandon's talk, you use uh, the word actors and operators. And I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure if I can conflate your two researches through that, mm -hmm. but in my imagination, if we have a latent image space or just a latent image mm -hmm. or a latent space of perception or whatever it is, um, then there are at least these two, but now with machine learning, it gets more complicated, of course, and that's mm -hmm. very interesting to me, but I don't know how to expand on that yet. But you get these like window messenger kind of situation in every one of these scientific spaces. And that refers again to your interglot, Priya, but also maybe to Brandon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good answer to you, but that's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it makes me wonder about visual interglots, maybe. This um, yeah. one of the people asking a question to us revisits something we've discussed a little bit, but I think is worth more discussion uh, for Priya. They write, you've described the profound potential of simulations and cosmological studies. The simulated images you showed are indeed very stunning. Do visual parameters, the visual parameters in your simulations serve both functionally and aesthetically? How do you decide on the determination and altering of visual elements in your simulations like colors, scales, textures, even visual effects and animation? And how do they affect the modeling results? Um, yeah, I'm thinking too of you know um, Rosa's talk pointing us to things like the the latent histories of race in color photography, right? Which That's tells right. on you know the very chemistry of the way that film operated in the mid 20th century. So what about the visuals that you give us, the the colors of the black holes, etc.? Yeah, right. So. Um yeah, that, that's a that's a great question, um, and I think that there are choices that are made that are very specific choices, 
and uh, that are made. And so, you know, there is um, intentionality behind those choices. Mm. And often uh, it, it, they are optimized for, as I mentioned, for familiarity. So mm -hmm. because these are very esoteric, abstract kinds of objects, you know, that you can't quite reach out and touch. And mm -hmm. so there's a there's a way in which part of the exercise is to make it intelligible and accessible. That is a, to a visual palette that anyone and everyone can kind of appreciate. So, you know, the fundamental mm -hmm. colors of heat the fact that it's white mm. hot and red hot and yellow. So that sort of black body spectrum sort of informs many of the choices. And some of them, uh, and some of the visualization is also scientifically driven in terms of the mm -hmm. phenomenon that I want you to draw, draw your eye to and attention to. Mm. So uh, what do you choose to show as dynamic? Because one of the problems mm. in all these simulations and um, uh, is the number of enmeshed embedded time scales and spatial scales that are all kind of mm -hmm. lumped together and you know in the universe when you go out at night and you see uh, you know a little wispy galaxy nearby you're seeing a two-dimensional projection of it right and the advantage mm -hmm. of a simulation is that we can give you the experience of you know dancing around it and seeing it in 3d which you never ever see right so it's mm -hmm. a reconstruction mm -hmm. so it's a simulation um in the in the sort of the dictionary word if you go and look up the mm -hmm. word of a simulation there's something about fakeness make believe mm -hmm. that is part of that mm -hmm. so there's that little bit of that element. But I wanted to come back to this larger yeah. question that everyone has addressed so beautifully, uh, Stefan, which you know you pointed out to, which is I think we need a sort of a new kind of lexicon. And you know, I am my personal obsessions are with mapping. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, we don't, as Brandon said and Rosa said, we can have a new, we can, we can come up with new kinds of alphabets. I mean, they don't, it doesn't have to be mathematics. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, pre um, models that already exist. We can really think of new kind of ways of, um, it seems if you look at any problem now, the it's not so much the problems are no longer, you know, you can't parse them into linear bits. It's all about networks and interconnections. So I think we need a new lexicon that will allow you to map connections. I don't know what it is. I mean, for people like Rosa to help us, help people like Brandon and me to figure out what might be sort of optimal ways of uh, getting people to think um, you know, both pedagogically and otherwise, what might be new ways of, uh, you know, visual clearly uh, because of the appeal, universal appeal of visual elements. Mm -hmm. Although I also I would think argue of color blindness, right? I, I also think of color blindness mm -hmm. or think of the different Absolutely. kinds of affordances, right? Or the fact that luminosity and saturation don't track the same in black and white versus in color. And so all these interesting confusions can happen when you move from you know, one coloring regime to another. Um, but I'll, I'll step back and Brandon, yeah. you were- I mean, and, you know, and the whole sort of inherent, um, you know, the whole idea of, you know, in science, a lot of these iconic methodologies, you know, there have been a very small set of people uh, who have been able to do science, who have got to define science, who've gotten to define mm -hmm. the symbology of science. And the right. question is, in converging to universals, there's always a danger that we are drowning out the multiplicity and the uh, and the the creative energy that uh, you know different kinds of individuals, different kinds of systems bring. So I think that is the challenge of our times. How do we mm -hmm. actually move away from restricted visual symbolic languages? Um, I, I don't I know, know that Stephen Brenda wants to add something, but I, mm -hmm. I just want to say maybe what you're both getting at is that um, most of our audiences have become too lazy because they're so used to established vernaculars and establish, established imagery for particular things. So maybe what we need is more dynamic interpretations. And I'm also thinking about like um, the materiality, so not just referencing materials but also using materiality as a signifying strategy right so to create kind of like 
multi, multi-layered folkloric vernaculars to translate scientific mm-hmm. imagery that is not static. Mm-hmm. No, Maybe that's like an informed, on. yeah, an informed that's material exactly vernacular. Right. I would say, yeah. Mm-hmm. And exactly that, that's right. Really things come to mind. Yeah, I mean, this is really what made me converge on this uh, obsessively on interglot. <laughs> you know, it's there's something mm-hmm. there that I feel that it has so many dimensions in which we could, you know, uh, mine mm-hmm. that metaphor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know well, my uh, dream. Homi Baba's uh, statement of the Wait. forked tongue? I just want to put that in there because that's such a nice mm-hmm. word for that. Where y- while you have like one layered imagery, you could fork it all the time. Fork tongues. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my dream for the way that I want to go about this problem, just personally, is, I mean, it would, you know, this is the dream, right? I, for every single scientific discovery, I could tell a story about it, right? Like put it into kind of a story form because that's a, that is a non-visual but very universal mm. uh, kind of, right? Folkloric, I heard, right? Uh, I would be able to also create a visual piece of art around it, which is right. And I'd also be able to gamify it. And somehow that's one we haven't talked about. It's another mm-hmm. kind of, you un- that's, mm-hmm. that's another u- largely universal. That's debatable. I- I'll ask the anthropology apologist, the room, whether mm-hmm. or not gamification is truly <laughs> universal, but, but I think, you know, there are certainly arguments of that. And so what I'm saying is I wonder if this interglot, if all of these different possibilities could live, I, I don't see these things in contention. I think you can have something kind of raw, at the middle of an interglot, but it can be adapted, right, for kind of whatever the constraints or needs or availabilities um, the, of, of where that science needs to be kind of translated. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're running toward the hour, but I want quickly to give you guys an opportunity to ask each other super quick questions. <laughs> I mean, what kinds of things came up mm-hmm. for you that that we haven't surfaced yet? Just you know, if we can offer something. Go ahead. Brenda. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, just I guess for I'm, me. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead. Well, just for me, the uh, I, I just doubling back to re- looking at Rose's uh, presentation and seeing and reading Rose's work. Um, just how the basic question of how we're even imagining the relationship between the information and in, in often in the, in, in, the, in the visual sense in your work, Rosa, how that kind of comports very neatly over to biology. I mean, we, we aren't even thinking about the problem of what a phenotype is correctly, which is why mm-hmm. we're never ever getting after very neat and clean genetic answers for, right, for even diseases. I mean, we're getting in interesting information, but it's not as simple as we thought and it's in part because we're thinking about the problem in a broken way, not unlike the way that you've constructed your resolution kind of problem in, in the visual and in other contexts. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. so that's just something I kind of I highlighted that I thought re- really was interesting. I'll stop there. Yeah, but I think mm-hmm. we have to give props to um, Stefan here because I think what he did is he created a really nice panel in which Priya, me and you, um, we kind of have this like, I wouldn't say like flow between us, but of course, Priya is researching a particular thing. Um, and so she's finding, trying to find models, whereas you're like reverse engineering also to see how things have become something. And then me personally, I'm trying to like establish this like a uh, tool to see how you can make things or how you can make maybe problems and redefine mm-hmm. uh, ways of seeing. Uh, so I see that that's how that came about, yeah. Mm-hmm. So thank you, Stefan. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, you so had much. Yeah. As well to add. The, I mean, I guess the um, only question that I had was about how do we? We are all united in our ambition of what we want. I think for um, the science, for science, society, culture, and so on. But I'm curious about you know, should we really aim for universals? You know, this is the question that I, you know, and I would really like Stefan to weigh in as an anthropologist where you've looked at, you know, you look at multiplicity and you're not, you're not as focused on finding the explanation for something, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a difficult question, Priya. Thank you for that. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, I mean, so much of cultural anthropology is precisely about demonstrating that things that people think of as universals are parochial and have histories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's various ways into that. You know, we can think about histories of color. We can think about histories of genes as holding information. And we can unwind all of those things and unwind the universality of those claims. Mm -hmm. And we are unwind we are winding up <laughs> uh, the time. I see <laughs> there's a clock flashing at me here. And I just want to thank you all three so much for this incredibly wonderful conversation and for the superb, just absolutely superb presentations uh, you recorded for us here at CAST and MIT. And just thank you so, so much, everybody. No, thank you to all of you. Thank you. That was absolutely a real privilege. Amazing. Pleasure. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Privilege indeed. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Stefan. So are we off camera now? Are we is this the lunchroom? <laughs>